Welcome to Close Up, Rewatching Film Classics. My name is Bruce Isaacs. I'm an academic in film studies at the University of Sydney. And once a month, I'm going to look at a single film sequence that, in my opinion, makes that film a classic. Just why do some movies stand out as classics or as masterpieces? I'm going to start with Hitchcock's Vertigo for a couple of reasons. One, I adore this film. I teach it. I write about it. And it constantly frustrates me. But secondly, it was recently anointed by Sight and Sound, certainly the most influential film poll, as the single greatest film ever made. That is an astonishing accolade. So I thought that would be a great way to start. We'll play through the sequence, do a general walkthrough, I'll set the context, and then we'll do it a second time, and I want to pull it apart. Okay, so we move here into Ernie's restaurant, and you're looking at one of the most famous sequences in the history of Hollywood cinema. This is the moment in which Scotty, played by James Stewart, first lays eyes on the radiant but enigmatic Madeleine Elster. And Madeleine Elster is a figure that remains mysterious in the history of American cinema. For example, without Madeleine, Lynch doesn't make Mulholland Drive. It's as simple as that. So notice the frame is mobile. We're shifting sort of slowly, languidly into Ernie's restaurant. And of course, you can see Madeline. You can see Kim Novak. She's this radiant contrast of green on red. Take a look at the, the background red. I'm going to come back to that a bit later, so I want you to watch it carefully. Fittingly, you've got Bernard Herrmann's famous score that introduces Madeline, sort of brings her into focus. It's a, it's a simple, subtle use of music score to focalize a narrative. So we leave her husband behind, and this is critical because this scene is about two people, a man and a woman, and the way they're going to relate to each other. This is Madeline's lavish exit from Ernie's restaurant, and it will catapult Scotty into the adventure of a lifetime. So honestly, that's it. It seems pretty innocuous, doesn't it? But I guess what I'm suggesting is in those 90 seconds are the essence of this wonderfully rich, complex, uh, certainly for me sometimes frustrating film. This is Hitchcock's revelation of Madeleine Elster. Let's go back. Let's go back to the start. Notice that it's our point of view. We're going into a restaurant. We become one of the diners, in fact. And Hitchcock's going to play a very interesting game with point of view. We pick up Scotty. But notice he pulls back, and the importance there is that we're going to merge our two perceptions. It's not Scotty's point of view, but neither is it precisely my point of view. It's something of a conflation. We pick up Madeline. At this point, she's sort of background. It's a long shot. But the movement in on the music suggests something far more pointed and focalized. And I want to suggest to you, it's something like a voyeuristic gaze. I mean, can you feel that? You feel something like the voyeur in cinema because we're moving between these bodies on either side and nobody can see us. We cut back to Scotty and it reminds us we're sharing the gaze. I'm going to pause there for a moment. Um, I hope you can see how deliberate, how stylized, how choreographed this uh, mise-en-scene, that's the, the, the technical term used for what is in a frame. There are a couple of games going on here. The frame is itself complexly designed. But have a look at the profusion of frames within frames. You can see it here. You can see the banners to the sort of doorway. That's one. But look deeper and you can see Madeline seems to be framed against the, the mirrored background on the wall. That's the second frame. Have a look at the picture frame on the foreground right of screen. So immediately I'm looking at four frames. Right, the banister, the mirror, the right of screen, plus the mise-en-scene of the scene itself. This is, of course, deliberate and strategic. Madeline is going to be a framed image for our contemplation in the very same way that Carlotto Valdez is a framed image when Madeline goes to the museum later in the film. We're going to play ahead, and now we're going to cut between Scotty and Madeline. And the point of the scene is, what is Scotty going to see as she comes up toward him? This is, of course, a revelation. She now pauses in the, the, the mid-ground frame, and it's the, the key pause of the film. All right, watch this very carefully. Mm. 
gonna pause there. I can't tell you how many times I've watched that movement in this film, trying to make sense of precisely what's going on. Firstly, did you notice the color saturation in the background? Let's take it back for a second. We cut from Scotty and the turn of the heads and the saturation in the background. Right, so what's going on here? It seems to me that we leave the husband behind and now there's an illicit uh, um, exchange of glances, of gazes, of looking at each other between Scotty and Madeline. Right, this is, th there's something illicit going on and this is really critical in the film because this movie is going to be about illicit ways of looking at people. I think the saturation speaks of something quite pointed but also interestingly symbolic. It's a kind of consummation in the act of looking. Right at that precise moment, Hitchcock represents uh, a sort of orgiastic viewing that in its intensity spills out of the frame in a spontaneous color saturation. The red just blows, right? It, it's this wonderful bloom of color. Um, I don't know of another moment like this in all of Hitchcock. It's the act of viewing as a sinister perverse and ultimately destructive way of engagement, right? This is going to be a theme through Hitchcock throughout the late 50s and through the, the, the 1960s. If you've seen Psycho, obviously. Um, but The Birds, Marnie, uh, a wonderful late film called Frenzy. All of these movies are about ways in which people look at other people and ultimately uh, reveal sinister or perverse aspects of their identity, their, their gender, their sexuality, their, their innate desire. And we're seeing this happening with Scotty in, I think, the most elegant example in Vertigo. Okay, that's uh, um, a reading of this exchange between Scotty and Madeline. But have a look at what Hitchcock then does. I'm going to play ahead a few seconds and have a look at a simple shot reverse shot between Scotty and Madeline and the way that their gazes are almost choreographed together. Okay, watch this. And I'm going to pause there. We cut from Scotty to Madeline, back to Scotty to Madeline, and they are rhythmically cut. There's a sense in which the camera is suggesting these gazes are aligned. They are not supposed to know of each other's presence. Certainly Madeline is not supposed to know of Scotty's. Scotty is supposed to appear oblivious. But clearly the camera has cut it rhythmically to show that these gazes are aligned and that they're moving in tandem. The film is really about deception. And I don't want to give anything away, but I want to suggest that Scotty is not the only one doing the looking year. And it seems to me the great revelation of Madeline Elster year is that she is also a figure of some deception. I pause here on, on, on one of the great final images of the sequence, but also of Vertigo, and you see Madeline and Gavin reflected in a mirror. This is going to be one of many mirrored reflections of Madeline Elster. And it's symbolic of... Um, uh, a form of deception and duplicity that will inform the film as a whole. This film is going to be about characters, Scotty, Madeline Elster, but also Midge, Carlotta Valdez, etc., who are in a sense doubled, though never simply themselves. There's always a deception at work. And so Hitchcock gives us the final great frame of the sequence, which is a full-length mirror. And I love the, the image for a number of reasons. It brings foreground, background, and the profusion of frames together in perhaps the most complex frame of the sequence, which is the full-length mirror and its reflection. Um, and it also leaves us with that disconcerting sensation that Scotty is not seeing this reflected image of Madeline. He's turned his head away. You can just see him on the right of screen. All in all, what we've got here is what seems initially on a first viewing innocuous. But what I'm arguing is a wonderfully complex, uh, rewarding sequence, as I've suggested, I've watched it so many times and taught it so many times. And what I recommend is going back to the film, having a look at it, and then getting a sense of just what the sequence is doing to open up um, the symbolic, the conceptual, uh, the thematic content of the film. And I think you'll, you'll, you'll agree that the sequence stands alone, but also feeds into what is really one of the very greatest films ever produced in American cinema. Uh, next time, we'll take a look at um, an absolutely bravura use of sound and time in Michelangelo and Tonioni's The Passenger.